It's a privilege to be here at Stanford University, and we are looking forward to an exciting uh, presentation to begin our day here at Stanford from Dr. Renee Perra. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about Dr. Perra's background, uh, and then she's going to give you some very exciting news uh, in our progress towards the clinic with her research. And hopefully she'll also t give you some sense of the tremendous amount of financial savings that might accrue to the state and to individuals that are trying to have uh, children through in vitro fertilization. The most important point is the contribution to healthy children, uh, children that uh, the, the parents uh, understand uh, <coughs> can effectively uh, be achieved through an in vitro fertilization uh, process where the chances of triplets is reduced. Uh, that's a, on the one hand a great surprise but a very difficult surprise for many families uh, and the ability uh, to uh, deal prospectively with the genetic issues for children being born uh, and the lar size of your family is very important. So Dr. Para is the director of the Stanford University Center for Human Embryonic Stem Cell Research and Education. Uh, she received her PhD from Cornell University, uh, where she was a, a, a Damon Runyon Fellow in Human Genetics uh, at the White House Institute at MIT. Uh, this was before she joined the faculty at University of California, San Francisco. She was recruited to Stanford University to direct the Center for Human Embryonic Stem Cell Research and Education in 2007. Uh, Dr. Perra has received numerous awards, uh, including those from uh, the, uh, as an outstanding faculty mem uh, mentor, uh, awards from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, uh, called the Bruce Stewart Award, and she was cited by Newsweek as one of 20 influential women in the, in the U.S. for her work in understanding human development. Her laboratory is focused on how cell fate decisions are made in the embryo, in particular how the germ cell lineage, which gives rise to eggs and sperm, is allocated between the somatic lineages, which comprise the rest of the body. She has derived several novel human embryonic stem cell lines and and uh, in, <coughs> induced pluripotent stem cell lines suitable for genetic study. Uh, and uh, she has an, also identified novel genes that function in human uh, germline stem cell development. Uh, Dr. Para received, uh, through her institution at Stanford, uh, a uh, shared facilities grant that actually went to Stanford. I think she was the driving force behind it. Uh, and she tells us, besides this phenomenal work coming out of that shared facility, that it has now led to $50 million of new grants from the data and research that was conducted in that shared facility. Tremendous return uh, on that shared facilities grant early in our career. So, uh, Dr. Para, we are excited to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here, and thank you so much, Bob, for uh, that nice introduction. It is truly a pleasure to talk uh, uh, to this group because CIRM has been so instrumental in uh, supporting our research, and I surely hope that uh, the CIRM's type CIRM itself, as well as uh, this type of an initiative, can be uh, moved forward more often in the state of California, where we depend so much on innovation. So what I want to talk to you about today is our work on human embryo and embryonic stem cell development. The central theme to my work is that by understanding human embryo development and how cell fate decisions are made in totipotent blastomeres, so in totipotent cells of the early embryo, that we can begin to optimize basic and clinical applications of stem cell biology. We can begin to understand and make perfect cells. And so with that, I'm going to give you an introduction to human embryo development. Then I'm going to talk about a paper that just came out in Nature uh, Biotechnology uh, in, that 
uh, described correlation of image data and molecular data through the first few days of development. And then I'll talk to you about other applications to stem cell biology and what I think are the major uh, challenges that we face for the next uh, decade or so. So on this slide, what you see is a panel of pictures showing human embryo development. In the upper left-hand corner there, what you see is that on day zero, there is a maternal pronucleus in an oocyte or egg. This maternal pronucleus, of course, is carrying the maternal or, or mother's chromosomes. On day one, the egg has been mixed with sperm, and you see that there are two pronuclei, one from the mother carrying the mother's chromosomes and one from the father carrying the father's chromosomes. Now, day one of human development is a remarkable day, and I think it's also likely to be a remarkably fragile day, as the whole period of human development, pre-implantation development, is remarkably fragile. But what's happening on day one is that these two pronuclei migrate towards each other, carrying their chromosomes, and as they do that, there's a machinery molecular machinery that has to erase the chromosomes of the epigenetic information that they're carrying from the previous generation. So if you think about it, on day one, the egg pronucleus used to transcribe or make mRNAs from, for the egg, or egg-specific mRNAs, and the sperm pronucleus used to make sperm mRNAs. And in fact, if you think about a sperm pronucleus, you could not imagine a more difficult pronucleus to reprogram, and yet the egg has the ability to do that. The sperm pronucleus isn't even on the right protein backbone. When we think about reprogramming somatic cells, it's a much easier job than reprogramming the sperm pronucleus. Now, following the fusion and this reprogramming, this epigenetic erasure of the chromosomes, and think of that as essentially the pronuclei fuse and the hard disk is erased, okay? What happens next on day two, you can see the first cleavage division. There's two cells, and with a cleavage division, what we mean is there hasn't been any net growth in the embryo. It simply duplicated its DNA or its chromosomes, and then it cleaved into two. Later on day two, you see that there's the second cleavage division, so the two cells have divided into four. And then late on day three, there's eight cells with the third cleavage division. Now, human development is actually very unusual in that it's occurring in what's called transcriptional silence. So think of these two pronuclei migrating towards each other. There's this reprogramming, and it's occurring in what we can think of as a sea of transcriptional silence, okay? And then suddenly, late on day three, the embryo turns on its own genome, okay? So there's a clock. There's a clock that's measuring time in the early embryo so that on eight late on day three, at approximately the eight cell stage, but we know it's independent of cell number because we've, we've looked at embryos that arrest with two or four cells, and what you can see is that the embryo still turns on its genome late on day three, okay? But for the first time, each one of those cells that you see in a healthy embryo will actually have turned on embryonic genes. So they were, the embryo, embryo has reprogrammed an egg and a sperm nucleus into an embryonic blastomere, or a human embryonic cell capable of making any cell in our body, and in fact, capable of making the extra embryonic membranes as well. So those cells are called totipotent, and they give rise to the entire embryo and all extra embryonic tissues. On day four, what you see is we've moved from eight cells to about 16 to 32 cells. And with the uh, division or the uh, uh, replication to 16 to 32 cells, a morula forms as the cells collapse on each other. And because the cells have formed this tight ball, the cells on the outside are now seeing a different media. They're seeing the media or the uterus if they're in vivo and the cells on the inside are just seeing each other. And that sets up the first difference 
in human development so that the cells on the inside go on to form the inner cell mass on day five as shown here and the cells on the outside form trophectoderm and those outer cells actually attach the embryo to the uterus. Now let's just think for one minute or less than one minute about what happens on day four if there's fewer than 16 to 32 cells. Okay. So if on day four the embryo reaches day four and there's less than 16 to 32 cells, there's a high chance, a high probability that those cells will all think they're on the outside. So you can imagine if there's eight cells on day four and they compact on each other, they all think they're on the outside. And what you have is a pregnancy where the entire pregnancy develops as extra embryonic tissues or trophectoderm, and there is no fetus. Okay. So by looking at human embryo development, we can begin to understand very common conditions in human development. On day six, the embryo hatches, and of course, this audience knows that much of the controversy uh, surrounding the derivation of human embryonic stem cells arises from the fact that they are derivatives of the inner cell mass. And so far as we know, human embryonic stem cells can form every cell type in the body. Okay. And if you want to talk to me a little bit later about how uh, the, we work on both human ES cells and IPS cells, but there are some distinct differences. But one message I would just like to leave you with is human embryonic stem cells, by definition, are derived from the inner cell mass. Okay? They are the only cell type that is de derived from the inner cell mass. Okay, so controversy surrounding human embryo issues is not new. So if you look at this slide, what you see is uh, a postdoctoral fellow of mine, Amanda Clark, gave me a copy of Look Magazine from May 18, 1971. And what you see is that uh, about seven years before the birth of Louise Brown, the first IVF child, there was Look Magazine had a uh, caption reading, taking life in our own hands, a historic step, the test tube baby is coming. Okay. And the article goes on to suggest that we are becoming too powerful and many bad things will happen <laughs> if uh, test tube babies are allowed to uh, be a reality. Then what you see on the right hand side, and I want to stress this is the entire manuscript of Steptoe and Edwards describing the first child born by IVF. And what you can see is it's two paragraphs long and it describes, it begins with, it's a letter to the editor, so it's not really a paper, but it uh, begins with the words, Sir, we wish to report that one of our patients, a 30-year-old Nalaparis married woman, was safely delivered by cesarean section on July 25th, 1978. And the baby that was born was a baby that was named then Louise Brown. Now, subsequently, the uh, first child in the United States was born in the early 80s, 1983. I went, once had a person interview in my lab who claimed to be the first baby born by IVF in the United States, and sure enough, when I looked up her name, she was. <laughs> but <laughs> that was very interesting. <laughs> that was in the early 80s, and what you know for sure, is that by the mid-1990s, the Dickey-Wicker Amendment had been put forth. And the Dickey-Wicker Amendment just sought to restrict federal funding for human embryo research. Okay, so what does it mean to have this unique situation where a clinical practice is allowed, but you ban research that has to do with the, the uh, validation of that clinical practice. Well, the first thing that you can see is shown on this slide, uh, which shows the most recent data collected by the Centers for Disease Control in 2007. And this is, shows the results of fresh, they're called fresh uh, cycles, so uh, approximately 102,000 women came in and were stimulated with hormones and eggs were retrieved, okay? 
On average, the women produce between 10 and 15 uh, oocytes or eggs. Um, and out of these, so there were 90,295 retrievals or women that produced eggs. And out of these, there were 82,347 transfers. So what does that mean in numbers? There's a roughly around a million to a million and a half embryos produced in the United States. There's not a real good census of the number, but there's approximately a million to a million and a half embryos produced in the United States. About 500,000 are discarded every year before they're even frozen down. And out of the remainder, there's 82,347 transfers, generally of two to five embryos in the US. Out of those transfers of two to five embryos, what you can see is there's 36,000 pregnancies. And you can immediately see by looking at this chart that there's a large drop off between the numbers transferred and the pregnancy. And that's the steepest decline. And there's 29,000 live births. Now, clearly the message from that slide was our efforts at in vitro fertilization are suboptimal. I don't think anybody even in the IVF community would disagree that IVF has never been optimized. But there's also some other consequences to our lack of understanding of human embryo development. It probably wouldn't surprise you if you think about, about it for just a bit that errors in human embryo development are the most common causes of all human birth defects. There are chromosomal abnormalities or missegregations. There are imprinting disorders. What is also clear to me is that we don't know the extent of errors in the first few days of development. So we actually know that in human development, point mutations, base pair changes in the DNA occur with a uh, uh, frequency of approximately one in every million base pairs or so. What we don't know is how often errors in that reprogramming or that erasure state occur in human development. And yet we're beginning to see in the IVF population, children born by IVF, that their gene expression is different than children conceived by a, a natural means. And what this suggests is that there is an input into the first few days of development where we can alter that epigenetic information just by culture. We also know that reproductive failure, embryo loss, and miscarriage are very common in the human population. And we don't quite understand why relative to other uh, animal species. And we also know that there are two complications to IVF that are a tremendous burden both on the couple but also society. And those are multiple births. So about 35 to 40 percent of births by IVF are multiples, twins or triplets. And these carry, although the couple will often be uh, quite joyous over the birth of twins and triplets, there are often complications in prematurity, low birth weight, and complications to organ development. In addition, there's what I consider to be a really deplorable uh, need for fetal reduction in some cases. So if too many embryos are transferred, and implant, there's a need to remove some of the fetuses in order to allow the growth of the remaining fetus and to ensure that the mother uh, is healthy. Okay, so I have long been interested in human embryo development for two reasons. One is human embryo development is our development. It's our origins. And understanding that is incredibly interesting. If you just contemplate for a minute that a sperm and an egg come together and you get an embryo and a fetus and a child, that's pretty remarkable. And the way our patterns are set up and the self-fate decisions must occur the same over and over again. And yet we know very little about how decisions are made. 
The second reason I've been interested in human embryo development is I just really felt that from a point of view of who I am, I understood it intrinsically. And I didn't see very many people doing high quality science on the first few days of development. And so we decided that we were going to make a map when I moved down here to Stanford from UCSF, and we were going to try to correlate imaging data, the best imaging data we could get on human embryo development with molecular pathways and the pathologies, okay? And this is a journey that I'm so excited to um, have begun because Basically, this is what I'm going to be doing pretty much for the rest of my life, <laughs> and it's so exciting to me. So what did we do? We published this paper in October uh, in Nature Biotechnology. We obtained a set of embryos um, that were frozen down or cryopreserved at the one cell stage. Now this is unusual. Most embryos are cryopreserved at the eight, uh, eight cell stage on day three. But these embryos had been cryopreserved early. They were formed in a Lutheran clinic, and the Lutheran clinic had reasoned that if the two pronuclei hadn't fused, they weren't really embryos, and they didn't have to deal with embryo disposition issues. Okay, So the clinic, uh, after several years, went out of business, and there were all these uh, pronuclear stage embryos, I would have to call them embryos. Um, and they were, by and large, nearly everybody donated their embryos to research. The couples were asked, what do you want to do with these embryos? Do you want to give them to somebody else for reproductive use? Do you want to just discard them, have them thawed and thrown away? Or do you want to give them to research? And they chose research. And so what we did was a series of four experiments where we took a set of embryos and we uh, thawed them and put them on small microscopes that were made by a graduate student here in uh, Stanford in the mechanical engineering department. And these microscopes were dark field microscopes. So what they are is the field is very low uh, intensity light. And we did that because people in the embryo field worry about light. Light can mutagenize. Um, we took pictures of the embryos every five minutes for five or six days, and we put those pictures together as a movie. So we have this time-lapse movie of the first few days of human development. And this is the most extensive movie that you would ever see of human development. Uh, over the first six days. And along the way, what we did was we removed some of the embryos and we looked at gene expression in single embryos and in the single blastomeres or single cells within the embryo. Okay. So if you're a great biologist, what you know first is that you have to check that you're not damaging the system. And so the first thing we did was we used mouse embryos for this. But we uh, did a control experiment to show that if we imaged the embryos, made movies of them, they developed at the same rate as the control embryos that were just left in the incubator at, in the dark, okay? So about 80% of mouse embryos form blastocysts. In humans, it's far fewer. Um, and then we showed that the gene expression between the embryos that had movies and those that didn't was the same. So there was no difference in their development or in qualitative measures of the uh, cells within the embryo. Okay. And so here is our first movie. And I'll just let you watch this. What you'll see is a series of embryos that have letters on them. And the letters were um, to identify the embryos when we transfer them. We have to transfer them to a new media after about three days. And they, the letters were assigned by developing a computer program that recognizes the pattern of sperm that are on the outside. Those small dots are sperm that did not get in. Okay, 
Okay, so that's the end of the movie. And what you can see is that some of the embryos make it to blastocyst stage and others don't. If you were to look at mouse embryos, they would nearly all, 80 to 90%, make it to the blastocyst stage. But the essence of the problem in IVF is you don't know which embryos are actually going to make it on day three very frequently. So what did we do? We went back and we did what's called tree analysis. We went to the beginning of the movie and we measured everything that we could about the embryos and we examined uh, statistically which uh, parameters might predict success or failure of a human embryo to make it as early as we could predict to the blastocyst stage, okay? So let me explain that. You see in A here the, a diagram of human, or a series of pictures of coming from the movie you just saw. In C what you see is that we ob observed that there were three parameters that we could observe on day two that would predict if an embryo was going to make a blastocyst by day five, okay? So they're prospective, non-invasive parameters that could predict human embryo viability. And these parameters were three things, and they're really interesting to think about. It took me a while to think about what they mean about how we begin. But the first parameter is the time in cytokinesis, okay? So what is that? So if this is an embryo carrying the two pronuclei that have fused, the embryo begins to form a waste, and when it begins to form a visible waste, we call that time zero, T equals zero. And within approximately 15 plus or minus five minutes, it should divide into two cells. From the time of seeing the waste until you see two distinct cells should be about 15 minutes. What's interesting about that is people had never really re observed that, and that's because the way we do clinical practice, that usually happens at night. So the idea that human cytokinesis, the first cytokinesis is 15 plus or minus five minutes, was a new observation. If we take that parameter and we add a second parameter, which is how long from t is it from two cells until you see three cells, that should be about 11 hours, plus or minus four hours. And then if you take a third parameter, you go from cytokinesis, three cells, how synchronous are the appearance of the third and the fourth cell, that should be within one hour, okay? So 15 minutes, 11 hours, and another hour, okay? And there's some real biology to think about when you think about those parameters. But if you look at what uh, has been accomplished here, what we observed was that by examining the time in cytokinesis, time to the, uh, from two to three cells, and then synchronicity of three to four, we could predict with almost 94% sensitivity and specificity whether or not an embryo was going to make it to the blastocyst stage on day two. Okay. We also, as I told you, we were interested in understanding what's going on inside of the embryo. And so uh, Steve Quake had developed a, a technology, microfluidic technology, to measure gene expression in single cells. And so we measured gene expression of 96 genes that we um, just chose based on mouse literature and what we thought might be important. And once we had measured the expression of these genes, what we found was that they fell into four patterns of expression that we called the embryonic stage specific patterns, one, two, three, and four. Okay, one, pattern one are uh, mRNAs, or genes that are expressed in the egg and those messages have to be erased or uh, degraded after fertilization. Pattern two are the genes that come on on day three, on target on day three. Pattern three are genes that come on a little bit later in development, and pattern four are those genes that are expressed at a very steady level. So what's interesting about this? The, what's interesting is that when we looked at pattern one, it forms, it, what you see is that the degradation half-life for messenger RNAs in pattern one is 21 hours. 
So fertilization occurs 21 hours later, there's half the message. 21 hours after that, there's one quarter. 21 hours after that, there's one eighth, okay? So it's actually forming uh, what we think might be a component of the clock that actually may trigger the embryonic genome activation. We also think that clock might be epigenetic modification. Now, the other thing that we looked at was single cells within the human embryo. And what we observed was that when we looked at embryos that had eight cells, what we found was different than what we expected by far. And that's, um, it, it's commonly been thought that human embryos uh, consist of cells that uh, the, such that the embryo proper, the entire embryo, lives or the entire embryo dies. And what we found was that by the eight cell stage, each cell is cell autonomous. It can run its own programs, okay? And that has some implications for how we think about embryo, embryos and embryonic stem cells. Okay, and then finally, we didn't want this to be um, uh, research that we had phenomenology associated with the human embryo. If imaging parameters can predict embryos that will make it with 94% sensitivity and specificity, distinguish those that will make it from those that won't, there should be some fundamental differences between those two groups of embryos. And so what this slide shows you, and because of time I won't go through it a lot, is that embryos that can make it and embryos that don't have different gene expression patterns. So there's fundamental differences. Those imaging parameters are reflecting basically the health and welfare of the embryo itself. Okay, so this is really, in a, to me, one of the most amazing slides that I've put together over the years of uh, research. But what we understood by using dark field microscopy, and dark field is a really old microscopy. <laughs> it's basically you're uh, eliminating most of the light in the field. What we observed was the timeline of human development for a normal embryo, and we observed that the uh, time intervals are tightly regulated. Human embryo development is not chaotic or random. It's tightly regulated. The uh, time in cytokinesis should be 15 plus or minus five minutes. The time from two cells to three cells should be about 11 hours. And the, two, the third and the fourth cell should show up almost at the same time, okay? Now why is that? Well, we think at the molecular level, the egg is providing a lot of RNA, a lot of the nutrients or molecules needed for development. At fertilization, it begins to degrade that one class of RNAs that may be a part of the clock that's actually involved in measuring time until embryonic genome activation. We think that after fertilization, when two cells are formed, it's important that each cell inherit about half of the RNA, half of the nutrients. You can imagine when you form a two-cell embryo, what happens if one cell uh, inherits more than the other. They will develop asynchronously, and the appearance of the third and the fourth cell will not be synchronous, okay? So we think that appearance of the third and the fourth cell is actually reflecting the status of the, uh, the equivalent status of the first two cells of the embryo. Okay, so what you see here is the imaging data, and then uh, our graduate student, uh, Kevin Loki, actually wrote a computer program to automatically track human embryo development. And this surprised me because it meant that human embryo development is showing rigor en rigorous enough principles that you can automate programs to predict it. Um, and what we hope with this data is that where most clinics today transfer multiple embryos in the United States on days three or they wait until day five until a blast blastocyst is formed. What we're hoping is that we can do early embryo transfer and transfer fewer embryos. And we'd like to use this automated program, which I'll show you here, 
And I will disclose here that a uh, company that I'm a founder of, Oxygen, has licensed this technology. So this is the same movie, and you can see that, or this is a, you can see that the movie has now been annotated. And the program can pick out which embryos are actually going to uh, make it to blastocyst stage. It might seem easy, but it's actually quite diff difficult to automate uh, uh, cell behavior. So, for example, just one example is when you take an embryo and you ask a computer to recognize the formation of the cytokinetic furrow, that's more difficult than asking a computer to recognize when the embryo has elongated. When the one axis is longer than the other, that happens at about the same time as the cytokinetic furrow, so we use that as a surrogate marker for our biology. Okay, now let me just finish up real quick with, with just one more observation. Why did I say human embryo development is fragile? Because most embryos don't develop. And over the years, there have been a number of papers that have come out and said that about 70%, well, sometimes the papers say 50%, sometimes the papers say 40%, sometimes 70 sometimes 80% of human embryos are chromosomally abnormal, okay? And I really thought that couldn't be true, okay? So when people would talk to me about this in my lab or when a journal club would come up, I always said it couldn't be true, that there was some technical error in how they were uh, looking at the chromosomes, okay? And of course, other people do technical errors, <laughs> but when we did it, <laughs> what we found was that about 70% of human embryos are abnormal. They carry abnormal numbers of chromosomes. And to me, it continues to astonish me <laughs> that so many embryos are abnormal. Um, there are many mechanisms that have been proposed for aneuploidy, for why, why are human embryos so abnormal in their chromosome segregation. Okay, so there's this body of literature that isn't really that large, but um, there is this idea that the human embryo has no checkpoints. So in most of our cells, like my skin cell, if my skin cell is carrying an extra chromosome, there's a checkpoint machinery that is very likely to detect that it has an ex extra chromosome and that cell will apoptose or die, okay? What's surprising is that doesn't appear to be what's happening in human embryos. And instead, they appear to push forward, carrying their abnormal number of chromosomes and trying to develop, okay? But we started thinking about this problem of why are there no checkpoints and what's going on with our data and we started focusing again on what does it mean when an embryo stops and stalls at the time that it would actually be forming two cells at cytokinesis, okay? And what we thought was maybe there is a checkpoint, the embryo has some vestigial checkpoint, and it detects the chromosome error, and we can see it by time-lapse imaging, and then it just pushes forward, okay? So how would you address this? So what we did was we went back to our time-lapse system. Now we had the embryos. We designed some plates, some wells, that allow us to put all the embryos in the same media, but there's different micro wells for each embryo to reside in. So now we don't have to do any tracking. But what we did was we grew the embryos to four cells. We took movies of them as they developed. And after the four cell stage, we separated each blastomere out and we looked at all 23 pairs of chromosomes, the 22 autosomes and the X and the Y, okay? We uh, asked the question, is this cell in this embryo chromosomally normal or not? Okay. And here's what you see in human embryos. This is by CGH. A normal embryo will have approximately two chromosomes, or exactly two chromosomes. And if the line measuring chromosomes from one end of this graph to the other, you can see that it's always falling between these, the, these two uh, parameters. Where there's a chromosomal abnormality, a monosomy, for example, 
only one, set, one chromosome instead of two, what you see is this big dip. There is a dip there on the set, second graph that suggests that that embryo only has one, it indicates that embryo only has one chromosome, five. Okay, chaotic means that who knows what happened and high mosaicism is shocking to me that a human cell can exist with that many different chromosomal abnormalities, but it appears to exist. Okay, we can also detect single errors. So monosomy 22 and trisomy 21, those were common in our embryo uh, bank. So what we did was we did the same imaging and we made these graphs and what we can see is something that really surprised me. If you look at this light blue X there, that's a trisomy 21, okay? When you look at single chromosome errors, which are meiotic errors, meaning that they're inherited in the egg, what we see is that the parameters are different. We can visually see that the embryo is developing along a different trajectory, even though we know that chromosome 21 is a, a chromosomal abnormality that can be present in three copies in the human, human genome. It's Down syndrome, okay? But we can detect these errors by simply looking at the movies, okay? And what is interesting about this now is, to us, is that we have connected what an embryo looks like with the molecular programs that are going on and the genetic composition, okay? And that's the first time that that has been accomplished. And this is the work of Sean Chavez in, in the lab. So I have, I could talk to you for several hours, but I know I'm not <laughs> supposed to, so I'm going to summarize right here. I put two summary slides in, a first one in case that's all the time I had, and a second one in case I made it further. So let me just stress. Human embryo development is characterized by massive reprogramming. There's an egg and a sperm pronucleus. We don't need egg and sperm programs to make an embryo. What we actually have to do is change those programs over to an embryonic blastomere. We're beginning to understand exactly what an embryonic blastomere looks like and what its uh, uh, fates or potentials are. The parameters of the first three mitotic divisions or the first two cleavage divisions leading to three or four cells before the embryo even turns on its own genes, okay? Remember I told you that about, about the eight cell stage, the embryo is gonna turn on its own genes. But with greater than 93.6% <laughs> sensitivity and specificity, we can predict if an embryo is going to make it before it turns on its own genes, okay? So what that means is that to me, is that success or failure has to be inherited, okay? Because the embryo hasn't turned on its programs yet. I've suggested it, that it's likely maternal, but there are uh, obviously ways in which the paternal genome can contribute greatly to the problem. But there's a bulk of data that suggests that the egg runs a large part of the first five days of development, and the sperm really kicks in about day six or seven. Embryos develop cell autonomously. They have leading and lagging cells by the eight cell stage. There's a process, there's a procedure called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis used sometimes that PGD requires or is based on the idea that all cells are equal. Uh, defects in underlying molecular programs are actually underlying the behavior, the abnormal behaviors that we see. So these are hardwired uh, differences. And what we're hoping we can do is really improve diagnostics, earlier transfer, fewer embryos, and reduce those adverse outcomes, the multiples and the need for uh, uh, induced abortion, and increase the success, okay, even marginally. But we think we stand a reasonably good chance. We also have gone on to begin to address how, what does this mean for stem cell biology in general, for how, the machinery that makes cell decisions in, in human development. And I'll just tell you two things. To address this, we've gone back to induced pluripotent stem cells, and a graduate student in my lab, Blake Byers, has uh, done an experiment with uh, technician Nam Nugent to reprogram cells from uh, Parkinson's patients, 
And what we want to get at is if a person has Parkinson's disease, sporadic Parkinson's in the population, or sporadic disease in general, much of the disease that we uh, have in the human population, we often ask the question, why did that happen to me or my loved one? Okay, If it's a, a sporadic disease. What we think is happening, and this is a hypothesis, and this is what I'll work on for a long time, we think that those first few days actually set up the environment. Those epigenetic changes are heritable. So what happens in the dish or in the uterus in the first few days where that reprogramming is occurring, that's heritable information that's being transmitted. And we know that in large part due to studies of identical twins who have identical genomes, but they die of different sporadic diseases. So the uh, environment and the early embryo development, we think, combines to actually determine uh, fate, so to speak. Now, does this matter? We think it does matter, because we think it leads to an understanding of two things. One is what caused the uh, disorder in the first place, and the second, we hope, would be more rational treatments. And, and Blake's uh, work, he's been, uh, this was supported by uh, CIRM New Line Grant, and then by uh, Early Translation Award. He's been designing rigorous assays to detect Parkinson's disease in a dish. And probably the major, uh, the major indicators of Parkinson's are uh, preferential death of dopaminergic neurons in response to stress and the presence of uh, aggregates of this protein called alpha-synuclein shown in D here in uh, neurons that we make in vitro. Okay, so with that, let me just say that I Obviously, I'm speaking to the choir, is that the saying? But the promise of human embryonic stem cells and iPS cells and human embryology, um, I cannot believe the progress that's been made. Sometimes I'm asked if there's hype, and I guess there's different ways to look at any uh, question, but I am astounded by how much we have done over the last years. We have unprecedented tools to begin to understand human development. Now, I'm a human embryologist, so of course I like to study human, uh, human development specifically. But it is also the case that in previous generations, we did not have the tools that would allow us to study human development and begin to understand these really big mysteries like where, did sporadic, where does sporadic disease come from in the human population? Um, and we have begun to impact human health. We certainly can impact reproductive health. I think that's just one of the lowest hanging fruits that there is. Reproductive health is something that we can change so dramatically because there's been so little funding in it in spite of the fact that 10 to 15 percent of couples are infertile. Somatic health, of course, we can begin to understand many of the common disorders at a molecular level. And then um, I won't talk about cancer because I'm really unqualified to talk about cancer, but clearly one thing I know is that when we begin to look at embryonic stem cells and iPS cells and embryonic blastomeres and compare them to cancer, you see this thing called drift, genetic drift. They pick up mutations and they drift in their chromosome number quite amazingly for a human cell. And so that, with that, let me just say the challenges are off. Uh, obviously extraordinarily uh, great, but each one of these has uh, really been radically uh, or addressed with radical solutions in the last uh, few years, especially I would say in California, and not to brag, but especially at Stanford. <laughs> um, and then what I'd like to do is acknowledge our collaborators on the uh, Nature paper with Tom Bear, Barry Bear, uh, team at the University of Minnesota and Connie Wong and Kevin Loki, Sean Chavez has done the um, chromosome analysis. The California Institute for Re Regenerative Medicine, what an amazing idea. What an amazing idea to fund research. 
I'm, I am just astounded by that. The March of Dimes gave us some money for our uh, embryo studies. The Stanford School of Medicine, especially Irv Weissman and the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine. And then amazingly enough, an anonymous donor has clearly <laughs> engaged in this work. So with that, let me just end with, I know many of you have seen this, but I cannot end without ending with T.S. Eliot when he said, uh, quoting him, the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And that's just a really big dream that we could share. Thank you. Phenomenal. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Pera, uh, we have a very tight schedule, but uh, as chairman, I had one quick question for you. Uh, could you just give us a 60-second view of where you are in progressing to the clinic in terms of timing? Uh, that would be great. Okay. So the um, work that you uh, saw has been licensed by Oxygen, A-U-X-O-G-Y-N, Incorporated, and uh, received funding by uh, uh, to venture capital firms in Silicon Valley here. And the plan is that the clinical trials to predict the success of blastocyst progressively will begin in January or February, and after that, the clinical the, uh, trials for pregnancy. What I am hoping is that we could also begin a clinical trial for something called polar body biopsy. It's incredibly expensive, but when the egg actually uh, is mature, it uh, releases one set of chromosomes before the sp uh, sperm actually fuses with it. And that one set of chromosomes could be used to diagnose all of, to refine our graphs so that we know exactly what's happening in that first division inside of kinesis. But thank you.